I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, www.messianicapologetics.net. For the next three episodes of Messianic Insider, we will be concluding our lengthy Two House Controversies series. Now, I've already said that I am absolutely sure we will talk about this subject matter again sometime in the future, but the Two House Controversy series is coming to a conclusion. And during these next three episodes, we will be going through the lengthy exegesis paper on Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. Have the two sticks been reunited? Just to make it absolutely clear, I am not someone who is a part of the two-house sub-movement. But as you have probably been able to see throughout this series, I have been promoting and supporting some third and fourth alternatives between the common two-house view that just about every non-Jew in the Messianic movement is some kind of a lost Israelite, and the wide-scale Messianic Jewish dismissal of the whole subject matter. There are groups on planet Earth today separate from the Jewish community in Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, who claim to be descendants of the exiled Northern Kingdom and have even been confirmed as such descendants by rabbinical authorities in Israel. Now, as it concerns the whole two-stick prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, and this is why such a lengthy analysis is required. What does this prophecy mean, and what have different interpreters and examiners, Jewish, Christian, and even Messianic Jewish, what have they said about this? If you simply look at this prophecy, and you put lost tribes, speculation, off to the side. But if you simply look at this prophecy, it's fairly clear that it is unfulfilled. The very title of our book, Israel in Future Prophecy, tries to place the whole issue of the reunion of the northern and southern kingdoms in the venue of eschatology. And so, during the next three Messianic Insider episodes, we'll be going through this very lengthy analysis. We'll be going through, of course, the passage, Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, and we will be evaluating what different people have said regarding its future fulfillment. If we simply look at the two-stick prophecy as fulfilled or unfulfilled, it's clear that it's unfulfilled. That doesn't necessarily mean that what is to be anticipated in the future is what the two-house sub-movement has posited. But it is clear enough that we have to factor this in to our end-time scenarios. And of course, what is the big question on everyone's mind right now? When are we in history? Hopefully, the following three episodes of Messianic Insider, taken from our extensive teaching archives, you will find to be very helpful, very useful, and it will answer more questions than ask them. I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, www.messianicapologetics.net. If you are new to the channel, be sure to subscribe for future teachings and updates. Messianic Insider is a podcast offering you a place to discuss critical and very deep issues, which affect 
the future and stability of our faith community. We thank you for your regular support and donations toward our ministry efforts. Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. Have the two sticks been reunited? Part 1. What is commonly called the two-stick prophecy, appearing in Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, has generated a great deal of attention since the late 1990s. This, in no small part, has been due to the large numbers of non-Jewish believers entering into the Messianic movement, embracing their Hebraic roots, and setting out on a life of Torah observance like Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus. Inevitably asked, or at least wondered by such people, is how much of a part of Israel they truly are. Do they just have citizenship in Israel's kingdom because of their faith in Israel's Messiah, Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, 3, 6, being a part of the Israel of God, Galatians 6, 16, being grafted into the olive tree, Romans 11, 17 and 18, or could such people at all be Israel on a physical level? Do these people have a lost Jewish ancestor? And that is why they are drawn into messianic things. Or are they even a part of what is commonly called the lost tribes? Questions have certainly been asked which have generated a wide number of responses. At the center of many of these questions is the oracle of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. This short selection of 14 verses has generated a huge amount of discussion for proponents, opponents, and skeptics of what has been widely touted as the two-house teaching. Many of today's Messianic Jews believe that all Israel was gathered together and restored in ancient times, and that nothing more really awaits. Many other people believe that a larger restoration of Israel awaits in the future eschaton. Many people do not want to touch the subject matter, considering it to be too flammable. Many people do not know what to do, especially with all of the opinions floating around, and are confused. What is the truth? Has all of Israel been restored, or is it something with more to be experienced in the future? Who is involved with this restoration? Only Jews? Only physical Israelites? Or all who acknowledge the God of Israel? The only way we can know for certain is by going to the text. If we do this, we do not have any excuse to overlook or dismiss it with some kind of hyped-up rhetoric about the two shticks. And if we do this, we also have to acknowledge that the overriding message of Ezekiel 37, 15-28 is about bringing all of God's people together, and that we should not unnecessarily be driving people apart with either this prophetic word, anything we might relate to it, or some kind of a associate agenda. Are we really ready to see whether the two sticks of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, have been reunited? I think that an exegetical paper on this passage of scripture engaged with scholastic proposals from the past half century or so is long overdue. I have been quite curious for a while as to what this investigation will uncover. Why some of the biggest and most well-known leaders and teachers in the two house sub-movement have yet to write anything detailed on this prophecy makes very little sense to me. Would they at least be interested in how other people have interpreted it? 
Jews, Christians, conservatives, and liberals? Or could there be some things seen in the prophecy that they do not wish to recognize because they have made this subject matter something a bit too simplistic and underdeveloped? Have some of today's popular or populist two-house proponents actually failed to follow some of this prophecy's clear directives. I have been interested in this prophecy for quite a while. I think that when we weigh not only the claims of the text, but also the different views that are out there, we can safely say that the two sticks of Judah and Israel or Ephraim have not been reunited. Yet, this prophecy also has an important message of fostering unity among God's people, which many of today's popular two-house teachers, who you are likely to encounter, have seriously overlooked or just absolutely not implemented. The Context and Purpose of the Prophecy The prophecies contained in the book of Ezekiel were delivered to the Jewish exiles in Babylon, likely sometime between 593 to 573 BCE, with the book of Ezekiel probably reaching its final textual form sometime after the exile in the later 500s BCE. Many of the messages that we see in Ezekiel were given to motivate the Jewish exiles so that they would know that in spite of their sins which caused their expulsion to Babylon, God had not totally forgotten about them, nor was it his intention to never restore Israel. He would erase their record of sin and return them to their land. The two-stick prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15-28, occurs within a much larger narrative of various messages of hope, Ezekiel 33.1 to 48.35. It is wedged between a description of the prophet Ezekiel as a watchman, Ezekiel 33.1 to 20, an explanation of Jerusalem's fall, Ezekiel 33.21 to 33, a prophetic word, Delivered against false shepherds, Ezekiel 34. Judgment declared against Mount Seir and Edom, Ezekiel 35. A prophetic word on how the mountains of Israel will be fruitful and how God's people will be given new hearts, Ezekiel chapter 36. And the valley of the dry bones depicting the resurrection of Israel, Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. After the two-stick prophecy, prophetic oracles are delivered against Gog and Magog, Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. And the remainder of the book of Ezekiel is spent discussing the reconstruction of the temple and the inauguration of a new spiritual order, Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. It is not at all surprising seeing the various themes of Ezekiel, why many people are confused, and why many do not really know how to handle the various symbols and images employed by the prophet. Are these images to be taken literally or figuratively? Will there be a real restoration of Israel to the promised land, or should we allegorize these passages? Does this concern an ancient 6th century BCE scene or something to occur in the distant future? Will there be a physical temple reconstructed for a future millennial kingdom where God's presence will manifest itself on earth? Or is this just symbolic of the ecclesia and God's people possessing his spirit? Anyone who chooses to give some kind of significance to the two-stick prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15-28, is admittedly walking into a place where this divine oracle 
is actually one of the least controversial words, given what is seen in the surrounding chapters. The Two-Stick Prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15-28, no different than the other prophetic words seen in chapters 38-48, to is seriously meant to inspire the Jewish exiles in Babylon. God had not abandoned them, and by his power, he was going to accomplish some awesome works. The prophet Ezekiel, in his unique style, uses physical objects such as eight zim, pieces of wood, to visually show his audience that the Lord is going to perform important activity. Daniel I. Block observes how, quote, there are no convincing reasons, historical or otherwise, to deny Ezekiel credit for both the visual and oral presentation of this prophecy in a text that affirms his literacy, he may even have been responsible for its transcription, unquote, i.e. Ezekiel 37, 16, 20. The circumstances that the two-stick prophecy intends to reverse is the division of the ancient kingdom of Israel, which had been split since King Solomon's death in 921-922 BCE, 1 Kings 12. The theme of the two-stick prophecy not only concerns the general restoration of Israel, but the reunion of Israel's divided kingdom. The southern kingdom, which had remained loyal to the Davidic monarchy, was known as Judah, 1 Kings 12, 22-44, with the northern kingdom known as either Israel or by the name of its largest tribe, Ephraim, i.e. Hosea 5.3, 5, 11 to 14. Ephraim is also used as the name of the northern kingdom, possibly because its first monarch, Jeroboam, was from the tribe of Ephraim, 1 Kings 11.26. The northern kingdom of Israel or Ephraim had been corporately taken away into captivity by the Assyrian Empire in 722-721 BCE, with Judah being taken away in a series of exiles by the Babylonian Empire in 606, 597, and 586 BCE. Somehow and in some way, God is going to miraculously bring all of Israel back together. Ezekiel has been prophesying on what was to come to Israel, Ezekiel chapters 34 to 39, most notably including a resurrection of dry bones. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. When we arrive at the two-stick prophecy, we see how the reunion of Judah and exiled Israel, or Ephraim, is the critical point where everything crescendos, the fulfillment of which can then lead to the succeeding events and establishment of the new temple. Ian M. Duguid considers how this oracle quotes acts as a hinge, both summing up the oracles of hope in chapters 34 to 37, and looking forward to the establishment of the new sanctuary, chapters 40 to 48, after the convulsion of evil in chapters 38 and 39, unquote. From a literary standpoint, one cannot avoid the significance that the two-stick prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, plays within the larger narrative of events seen in Ezekiel chapters 33 to 34 all the way to chapter 48. Because of the importance of the two-stick prophecy within the expectation of Israel's restoration, it should not be surprising that there does exist the very real possibility of being burned when trying to read and interpret it Charles H. Dyer 
has to mention one view of how, quote, some have claimed that the two sticks represent the Bible, the stick of Judah, and the Book of Mormon, the stick of Joseph. However, this assertion ignores the clear interpretation in verses 18 to 28 and seeks to impose a foreign meaning on the sticks. Unquote. One only need to add to this mix various speculations made by both British Israel and Christian identity people and their many offshoots and the significant anti-Semitism they promote. For some, the association of these groups to this prophecy is just too much, and so they think that it is best to avoid the prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, altogether. But even though there have been abuses with the two-stick prophecy, and no one can deny how there have been aberrant groups who have interpreted it throughout recent religious history, it is nonetheless a part of the biblical canon that cannot be avoided. At the exact opposite end of the theological spectrum, one encounters the thoughts and sentiments of liberal interpreters who engage with Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. Catherine Fisterer Dar makes the remark of how God's, quote, plan for the people encompasses not only those who survived the collapse of Judah and their offspring, but also the descendants of those northern Israelites who, in the wake of Assyria's defeat of their kingdom in 721 BCE, were dispersed across the Assyrian Empire a century and a half earlier. Far-fetched as this may sound, it was a pulsating hope at the time. Unquote. Yet, liberals think that this is not something we are to really take that seriously today. Dar further notes various challenges that have existed concerning the authenticity of Ezekiel's prophecy, specifically in how, quote, from the perspective of many modern-day commentators, there is evidence to suggest that in addition to clarifying glosses interspersed here and there, the original Sign Act account was subsequently expanded, unquote, by later redactors. So, liberals say how much of the two-stick prophecy is real cannot be known for certain, and we need not give it too much significance. While most proponents of a larger restoration of Israel yet to come adhere to the view that the prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, is yet to be fulfilled. Few are actually aware of the wide diversity of interpretations that exist in contemporary theology today. Jewish and Christian commentators have had more time to deal with the book of Ezekiel than any of today's messianics. Even though one can correctly assume that lay persons have been largely ignorant of the two-stick prophecy, it is not right for us to assume that rabbis and theologians have been totally ignorant. Anyone who has had to write a commentary on the book of Ezekiel has had to interpret it on some level. This most especially includes conservative evangelical interpreters who consider 37, 15 to 28, to be an authentic Ezekielian prophecy that somehow concerns the future, with whom we will be engaging the most. As John B. Taylor summarizes it, quote, In the restored Israel, the old divisions of north and south will be abolished and the nation will be united in God's hand. The interpretation of this, however, raises a number of controversial issues. If the inhabitants of Israel or Samaria were scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire, is there any prospect of their descendants being literally brought back with the exiles from Judah into the Promised Land? 
Or are we to understand Israel as simply consisting of those men of northern tribal origin who had associated themselves with Judah from time to time? Do we allegorize it all and see it simply as a picture of the church, the new Israel, united in the future kingdom of God? Unquote. These are only a few of the interpretations of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, which are present in today's theology. Taylor is right to recognize, though, that the vision foresees the removal of divisions between northern and southern Israel and the establishment of a single sanctuary, reversing the split enacted after Solomon's death. 1 Kings 12, 25-33. And, not to be overlooked, is how Ezekiel's word is to be applied to the daily mission and focus of today's believers, where we strive to see the Lord's people all brought together as one in Him. In our examination of this prophetic oracle, we will assume that the material is more or less authentic to Ezekiel himself but that Ezekiel was probably not the one who transcribed it in its final form. Our responsibility is to deal with the text in its final canonical form, recognizing how all of what is seen in Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, is concurrent with the will of God and overall message of the prophets, even if a few points here or there might have been added by a later editor. Leslie C. Allen specifically describes how, quote, verses 15 to 28 represent a basic text that has been subsequently amplified, as is the case with very many of the literary units in the book. Its early part derives from Ezekiel, but seems to be later than verses 1 to 13, which still reflect the shock of the catastrophe in 587 B.C., it looks back at the crisis reflectively and ponders deeply upon its reversal. Unquote. He notes his view that whether verses 23 to 24a are original to what Ezekiel first delivered or are a further reflection on Israel's restoration, quote, is not easily decided. Unquote. I think that if those ultimately responsible for compiling Ezekiel's prophecies, may have noted some additional things not explicitly stated by Ezekiel in his act of putting the two sticks together, we need not think that Ezekiel's prophecy has been tampered with. Such redactors had to just be as divinely inspired as the prophet Ezekiel himself was in their work of preserving his oracles for future generations of God's people. The Prophecy Ezekiel 37, 15 through 17 The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, And you, son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it, for Judah and for the sons of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them for yourself one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. New American Standard Ezekiel 37.15 The two-stick prophecy begins with the important indicator of its origin. Ezekiel says, A message came to me from the Lord. New Living Translation The term devar simply relates to word, or quite possibly also, an affair thing, holiday lexicon. This Devar Adonai coming to Ezekiel is simply a recognition of the prophecy's divine origin, as the revelatory work of God is often expressed by the word of the Lord came to or upon a person. Theological word book of the Old Testament. Being such a divine matter, any interpreter of Ezekiel's prophecy that follows has to make sure that he or she is sure to render due honor 
to the source from which it came and his intention for his people. It is a very important matter to our Heavenly Father, which is not to be mocked, misappropriated, or abused. Ezekiel 37, 16. The prophet Ezekiel is instructed by the Lord to take a physical object and perform a symbolic act. He tells him, Son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it. When reading this prophecy, we are not at all unjustified to ask, Who is this Ben Adam? Is it simply describing Ezekiel as a mortal? New Revised Standard, New Jewish Publication Society version, or is more intended? In verse 19, we later see how it is God himself who fuses Israel together, while Ezekiel might be the one called to pick up a piece of wood and write on it. Is it at all inappropriate to recognize this Ben-Adam as ultimately being the Son of Man, Yeshua the Messiah? Scholars largely recognize how Son of Man is the one term that the Messiah refers to himself as in the Gospels more than any other, originating from the various Danielic references to the Bar Enosh, who is given ultimate power and dominion. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. It would certainly not be a stretch to conclude that even though Ezekiel takes the stick and presents it to his audience of Jewish exiles, that it is ultimately God's Messiah who must be the actual one who restores Israel. What does the physical object or stick represent? Ezekiel says how the Lord instructed him, Take for yourself one stick and ride on it, for Judah and for the sons of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and ride on it, for Joseph the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel, his companions. The first stick represents the southern kingdom of Judah, and the second stick represents the northern kingdom of Israel or Ephraim. But is it really a stick? The Hebrew term etz has a variety of possible meanings, including both the plural and the singular tree and trees, as well as wood and timber, holiday lexicon. The two objects that Ezekiel holds in his hands can very well be considered sticks, but they could just be some generic pieces of wood that he picked off from the ground. S. Fish considers the ets to be an, quote, emblem of the royal scepter, unquote. One of the most intriguing views of what the ets represents compared to the rest of them, is reflected in the New English Bible extrapolation. Take one leaf of a wooden tablet. Are the two pieces of wood that the prophet Ezekiel is called to take some kind of a wooden tablet or board? This position is especially argued by Bloch, with supports given from various ancient Near Eastern sources. His viewpoint is highlighted by the fact that the prophecy does not envision the reunification of the monarchies of the northern and southern kingdoms, with the Ets representing some kind of regal staff, but of the kingdoms themselves. Quote, Nowhere is the union of the northern dynasty with the Davidic house contemplated. On the contrary, the northern kingdom was considered an aberration from the beginning and all its kings illegitimate. Here, Ezekiel takes extra pains to link these wooden objects with their respective nations rather than their kings, and in the interpretation to follow, he will highlight Yahweh's activity of bringing the descendants of Israel to their own land and making them one nation." Unquote. The necessity of the pieces of wood that Ezekiel is to join together, being writing tablets, in the view of his audience, at least a block, is substantiated by some other prophetic words. Isaiah 30, verse 8, Now go, 
write it on a tablet, luach, before them and inscribe it on a scroll that it may serve in the time to come as a witness forever. Habakkuk 2.2, 2, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, Lukot, that the one who reads it may run. Both references New American Standard. With these other prophecies in view, it is certainly not outside of the realm of possibilities for the two pieces of wood for Ezekiel to be holding to be some kind of ancient writing tablets. This could be a bit more significant for the prophet's audience than just two generic sticks, which he might have difficulty writing on. From this angle, Christopher J.H. Wright connects this to what might make the most sense to 21st century people, paraphrasing verse 16 with, Take a single sheet of notepaper and write this on it. Then take another single sheet of notepaper and write this on it. Now glue them together down the middle to make the two sheets into one new single sheet. The reason for some that writing tablets or boards, as opposed to just generic pieces of wood, are to be preferred is because upon them the redemptive work of God can be transcribed. For some interpreters, it is insufficient for just Yehuda, Yosef, or Ephraim, and then some other scribbling to be whittled onto a common stick, which may not even possess enough space to contain more than a few words. In Bloch's estimation, quote, the boards offer visual affirmation of the truth declared in the following promises that all Israel would participate in the envisioned restoration. No tribe or clan would be missing once Ezekiel had presented his interpretation in the sign action verses 21 to 28, he would have used these tablets to record the oracle, unquote. This reason is certainly compelling because the prophet Ezekiel would have been unable to record the reunification oracle on a stick that only gave him a few inches to carve into. Furthermore, writing tablets or boards could be used later as a primary source to compile Ezekiel's prophecies into their canonical form. Bloch's view of the wooden objects to be fused together as writing tablets or boards is both interesting and compelling, although it is speculative. It is possible that the prophet Ezekiel used some kind of ancient writing board, but then again it may be unlikely, as Ezekiel has used more common objects to make previous points to his audience. The Septuagint renders ets as harabdos, itself having a variety of possible meanings, including a rod, wand, stick, switch, but here most likely pertaining to a staff of office, Liddell Scott. Allen, but more because of the wider themes of kingship, verse 24, opts for the ets being some kind of regal staff. He remarks, quote, the sticks have a national significance insofar as they suggest the institution of monarchy that represents the nation, unquote. Using staffs is also an important feature seen throughout the Tanakh. The rod or mate of Aaron actually sprouted almond blossoms. Moses therefore spoke to the sons of Israel and all their leaders gave him a rod apiece for each leader according to their father's households, twelve rods with the rod of Aaron among their rods. So Moses deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. Now on the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds." Moses then brought out all the rods from the presence of the Lord to all the sons of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. But the Lord said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumblings against me, so that they will not die. Numbers 17, 6-10 New American Standard 
the post-exilic word of Zechariah 11.7, believed by many to be based on this oracle in Ezekiel, uses a staff or makel to make an important point. So I pastured the flock doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock. And I took for myself two staffs, the one I called favor and the other I called union. So I pastured the flock. New American Standard. Also, not to be overlooked, per what ets may mean in Ezekiel, is how the Apostle Paul describes Israel as an olive tree, with natural branches broken off and with wild branches grafted in. Romans chapters 9 through 11. Weighing all of the options together, whether we are to view Ezekiel's ets as a writing tablet, a regal staff or scepter, or just a stick or generic piece of wood, the default option is to just call it a stick. We can safely disregard ets as being a tree, simply because of the fact that unless Ezekiel possessed superhuman strength, or there really were really some small bonsai-like trees convenient, it would be difficult to see him pick up two trees and to try to join them together. While I personally find Bloch's writing tablet hypothesis intriguing, as have others. For the sake of our examination, we will simply refer to what Ezekiel joins together as sticks or pieces of wood. The prophetic point being made, more than anything else, is that they are to become one. The term echad, or one, is used a total of ten times in this passage, an emphasis on the theme of unity that God will bring to Israel. Anyone who reads the two-stick prophecy of Ezekiel 37, 15-28, recognizes how, on the whole, it is a message of the unity that is to take place between Judah and Israel or Ephraim. Everyone agrees that the stick marked Yehuda and the stick marked Yosef or Ephraim represents the people of either the southern kingdom or the northern kingdom. But there is no agreement about how to render the wider two clauses, Le Yehuda, Belifne Yisrael, Havero, or Haverav, and Le Yosef Etz Ephraim, the Kol Beit Yisrael, Havero, or Haverav. There are some textual variants in the manuscript traditions that have to be weighed, and we may also have to consider a slightly wider window of restoration of Israel prophecies in order to make a determination. First of all, how is the preposition Lamed, Le, to be viewed in what the two sticks represent? It can mean to, for, concerning, or indicate some kind of possession, as in belonging to. New International Version. Does each stick represent either Judah and Israel as a group of people? Or does each stick represent a power that each possesses? Does it at all regard something that either Judah and Israel must give up to be reunited? Or are these just symbols? Bloch argues that we should view Lamed, Le, quote, as a Lamed of reference, unquote meaning that Le Yehuda and Le Yosef mean pertaining to Judah, pertaining to Joseph. Secondly, if one is comparing Bible translations, it is not too difficult to discern a difference between versions like the New American Standard when compared against either the Revised Standard or New International Version. One speaks of Judah and Israel, having some kind of companions. The other two, and also New Revised Standard, New Jewish Publication Society, English Standard Version, the Holman Version, etc., have something like, and the Israelites associated with him, and all the House of Israel associated with him. New International Version. From this point of view, rather than the people of the House of Judah, 
and the people of the house of Israel, or Ephraim, both possessing some kind of associated companions from outside themselves, the only companions seen are the natural-born Israelites who make up either house. We cannot overlook the fact that there is a difference between the kere, what is read, and kativ, what is written of, verse 16. What is read is chaverav, which is implied to be the Israelites or all the house of Israel associated with him. New Jewish Publication Society version. Only members of either Judah and Israel or Ephraim. What is written is chavero, simply meaning his companion or companions, which can be viewed as a third group of people connected to Judah and Israel or Ephraim, but still a third group of people. Most interpreters choose to follow the Kativ rendering. The prophecy of the two sticks was originally directed to a Jewish audience in Babylonian exile. They would probably have thought that a reunion with the scattered northern kingdom was utterly impossible, and so we certainly cannot deny how the two sticks the prophet Ezekiel is directed to present to them principally represent these two divided kingdoms. Those of the exiled southern kingdom who made up the tribes of Judah and Benjamin were intended to be encouraged by this oracle. The art scroll Chumash notes for us, quote, The prophecy of this Haftorah, connected to Vayigash, Genesis 44:18 to 47:27, was a source of great comfort to the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, for even if their long-lost comrades of the northern kingdom were assured that they would again become part of the nation, surely the two southern tribes could be certain that God was not forsaking them. Unquote. The assimilated exiles of the northern kingdom were not in Babylon to hear Ezekiel make his prophecies, but those from the exiled southern kingdom certainly were. All are agreed that at least two groups of people, Judah and Israel or Ephraim, are involved in this restoration. But is there really a third group, a group of companions? Is the kere or kativ right? The singular term chaver can mean united associate companion. Brown Driver Briggs. It appears in Judges 20:11, where the people of Israel are gathered together as one man companions. Young's literal translation. Those of Jerusalem are chastised in Isaiah 1:23 with. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. In Song of Songs, we see references to the flocks of your companions and, O you who sit in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Song of Songs 1, 7, 8, 13. Both references New American Standard. Haver has a variety of usages, which although can be a reference to all of those people who compose either Judah or Israel, Ephraim, could also be a reference to people who have joined alongside Judah or Israel, Ephraim, and are involved along with them in the restoration process. If one chooses to follow the kativ of verse 16, chavero, then the singular chaver would need to be rendered somewhere along the lines of an associate, a companion, fellow. Jacinius's Hebrew Chaldee lexicon to the Old Testament. While his companions, New American Standard, is seen, his associates would also be a proper translation as well. That there is some group of people associated with Judah and Israel or Ephraim is certainly implied by verse 16. But are these people those of the Israelite tribes that made up the northern or southern kingdoms, or associated companions from the nations to be likened unto the gerim or sojourners seen in the Torah. It would seem a bit redundant to include either the kere haverav or 
Ketiv Havero, when both Judah and Joseph or Ephraim referenced, would be an indicator enough for the people of the two divided kingdoms. The presence of Havero, his companions or his associates, points us in the direction of more people than just the descendants of either the southern kingdom of Judah or northern kingdom of Israel or Ephraim being involved in the restoration process. The Greek Septuagint has some very interesting renderings that need to be considered in our deliberations. The first rod concerns Iudon kai tus huius Israel tus proskemenus ep alton. And the second rod concerns to Iosef rabdon Ephraim kai pantas tus huius Israel tus pros tetephentas. This is a fairly literal translation of the Hebrew. Both Judah and Israel or Ephraim have a group of people attached to them designated by the plural participles proskemenus and prostephentas. The first participle, a verb functioning as a noun, proskemenus, a group associated with Judah, is derived from the verb proskemai, meaning to be attached or devoted to Liddell Scott, his adherents, Brenton. The second participle, prostephentos, a group associated with Israel or Ephraim, is derived from the verb prostephemi, which BDAG first defines as to add to something that is already present or exist, either those that belong to him, Brenton, or that are added to him. The opening message of the two sticks, representing Judah and Israel, or Ephraim, and who the companions are, whether they are Israelites who make up either house, or companions from the nations at large, can only really be known by weighing in other prophecies of Israel's restoration. What I actually consider to be the most important prophecy that is to guide our overall exegesis an understanding of the Father's mission is Isaiah 49.6, where he says of the Messiah, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. New American Standard the Lord is not only planning to bring Judah and Ephraim together. His salvation is going out to the entire world. We are thus on a safe footing to conclude that the companions of verse 16 are largely not people who compose either Judah or Israel Ephraim, but are instead non-Israelites from the nations at large who are involved in the restoration of Israel and are to be incorporated into an enlarged kingdom realm of Israel in the eschaton. The restoration of Judah and Israel or Ephraim really does involve three and not two groups of people. This could just about qualify anyone who acknowledges the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it is most probable that the significant majority of people involved in the two-stick reunion are actually welcome companions from the nations themselves. Ezekiel 37, 17. The prophet Ezekiel is instructed by God to do something with the two sticks. Then bring them close to yourself, one to the other, like one piece of wood, and they will become united in your hand. Art scroll to knock. The two sticks are to be made into etz echad, representing a reassembling together. We can certainly recall here the similar word of Hosea 1.11. The sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. New American Standard. Perhaps most significant and reflective would be the previous oracle of Ezekiel 37, 1-14, and the reassembling of the dry bones. Just as Judah and Israel are to be brought together in the day of Jezreel, 
Hosea 1, 11b, also Revelation 16, 16, so does the revivifying of the dry bones indicate the future resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. This is a very good indicator that this word of Judah and Israel becoming a united etz occurs subsequent to the eschaton. Most of what is communicated by Ezekiel thus concerns the future eschaton and not necessarily the Jewish exiles to whom he was speaking in Babylon. Ezekiel 37, 18, and 19. When the sons of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not declare to us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. New American Standard. Ezekiel 37, 18. Seeing Ezekiel join two pieces of wood together, the curiosity of the people is aroused, something that is not uncommon. Ezekiel 12, 9, 21, 7, 24, 19. They ask him, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? New International Version. To these exiles, they would be confounded at what all this symbolism would mean. Was the prophet Ezekiel just mentally disturbed in picking up two pieces of wood off the ground, joining them together? Block indicates, quote, If the restoration of Judah represented a major problem in the people's minds, how much more would they have stumbled over the idea of the restoration of the northern kingdom? Unquote. They would have likely thought this was a sheer impossibility. Moving forward to today, we are a generation that has actually witnessed a fair number of prophecies regarding Israel's restoration. Most notably, we have seen the fulfillment of Isaiah 66, 8. Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? New American Standard. Via the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Yet, many evangelical Christians and Messianic Jews, though, are surprisingly unfamiliar with the word like Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. Perhaps various leaders have stayed away from talking about a prophecy like this because of controversies in history over the lost tribes of Israel. At the same time, if there is more to be expected in salvation history regarding the restoration of Israel in the last days, a word like this deserves to be considered and probed for significance. When people approach the two-stick oracle of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28, the question, will you not show us what you mean by these, Revised Standard Version, is not only tended to be asked by many who encounter it and are asking questions. It is prayed to God. People really want to entreat the Lord for answers. There are many people who see the growth of today's Messianic community particularly Jewish and non-Jewish believers being brought together in common cause and unity and who instinctively know by the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of them that more is going on. The basic question of what does all this mean is being asked, but the possibility of the answer involving the two-stick oracle of Ezekiel 37, 15-28 is more than frightening for a few. What is really going on in today's Messianic movement? Is it just a movement designed to see a form of Jewish Christianity come forth that will not really include anybody but Jewish believers? 
The question of verse 18 has notably been answered in a variety of ways, some of which have and some of which have not, been in alignment with the Lord's objectives. Jews, Christians, and Messianic Jews have all approached the subject, at times, with an agenda. Ezekiel 37, 19 The prophet Ezekiel might have been the one called to take two pieces of wood and visually show his fellow exiles that the divided, scattered, and exiled northern and southern kingdoms would reunite. Yet, it is God himself who performs the reunion. Ezekiel is to just declare, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. God is the one who says, Ani locheach, I am going to take. New International Version, New Jewish Publication Society Version. This is a very special divine action that is to be performed. The kingdom of Israel had been split ever since Solomon's death, 1 Kings 12, and attempts made by southern kingdom monarchs like Hezekiah or Josiah to reunite with people from the northern kingdom, 2 Chronicles 30, 34, 6, 9, 35, 18, had really not succeeded. Duguid notes, quote, the solution to Israel's lengthy history of internal division is not to be found in the appointment of a binational committee to develop a peace process, but in the divine act of reuniting his people, unquote. And examining the prophecy, it really will take an act of God to reunite Judah, Israel, or Ephraim, and companions from the nations into a single community chosen not only for him, but for his end-time service to the world. Daniel 12.3, Titus 2.14, et al. Those who give any significance in their theology or praxis to the two-stick prophecy have to recognize how the job of ultimately restoring Israel's kingdom is to be left in the hands of the Lord. While people may recognize various things in motion and rightly have a much bigger vision for the Messianic movement than it just becoming another branch of Judaism, the final orchestration of events is to occur in his perfect timing. It is certainly not the job of any Messianic ministry or denomination or pseudo-denomination to try to declare the reunion of Judah and Ephraim from the halls of some conference, which would actually contribute to seeing people driven apart. Nor is it the job of any interfaith Jewish-Christian organization that might downplay the place of Yeshua in a person's salvation. Only God can orchestrate this reunion. He might use flawed people to do it, but the responsibility is ultimately his. It is quite important to remember how King Rehoboam would not do what was right to serve the people contrary to the advice of his counselors. 1 Kings 12, 7. He had an opportunistic agenda and the division between the northern and southern kingdoms was finalized. Today, it is not difficult to see how sectors like the two-house sub-movement, are utterly riddled with similar opportunists who have not fully heeded the warnings given in the historical books of the Tanakh. Thankfully, though, we can have confidence that God will see his promises come to pass. If you all found this content enjoyable and useful, please be sure to drop a thumbs up for this teaching. As always, we thank you for your continued support of our ministry's efforts. God bless and shalom, and we'll see you again soon. In the meantime, be sure to check us out online at www.
messianicapologetics.net.